Hey everyone, Dr. B here, Ask the Dentist. Thanks for joining us. Very exciting today. We're here with James Nestor, one of my favorite authors, not because he wrote uh, a book on one of my favorite topics, just because he's a great writer. He's a great guy. We've been going back and forth for many years. Uh, James, I remember when you first called, I, my daughter said there was a journalist that writes for Outside Magazine. I was at the airport uh, I think I was going to Mexico with the family and I took the call and and I think I I uh, got a little passionate about mouth breathing and mouth taping because that was your question. That was probably three, maybe four years ago because it took two years to publish. You published right before COVID, um, not by design, of course. And you wrote one of the great bestsellers on, I think, on health in the last 10 years. The, the book is obviously called Breath. Um how do you feel about it now? We we did an interview. You interviewed me. I interviewed you. I think that was new for both of us back then. A lot has changed. Um, how do you feel about your success now? Because when I first interviewed, it was in July. The book had come out, I think, right before COVID. Correct me if I'm wrong, before we knew about COVID. And it was already selling very well. But But now it's been two years. The dust has settled. What is your feeling on what 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 happened? I mean, how do you feel about it? So first of all, you were one of the first people I talked to uh, who was talking about sleep tape. I had read your book and this was, I would love to say it was three years ago because then that would make us a little younger than we are right <laughs> now, but this was like five and a half years ago. It yeah. was a long time. Yeah. I read your book and I said, well, this guy doesn't seem crazy. And you were confirming some of the other research I was finding and I wanted to talk to you. And Luckily, you returned my call, which which was pretty surprising as well. And we've been sort of talking back and forth since. Uh, we did do an interview about two years ago, two and a right. half years ago. And the book came out about six weeks into lockdown. So six to wow. seven weeks into lockdown. And so I have lived my entire book tour in the shadow of the COVID pandemic here by complete happenstance. You know, we've got a global respiratory pandemic that affects the your breathing and i had worked for what seven years on a book about breathing that came out six weeks after lockdown so it's just insane coincidence but yeah here we are now three almost three years later um the 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 book is um it's a huge success uh to, to me when i heard that it had been translated into what 30 plus different languages is it 35 now yeah. I mean, obviously, the message is very universal. Um, it's well liked by pretty much everyone on the planet. Um, I, I think I told you the story. Um, I, I was with Catherine and David. It was kind of a surf trip. My granddaughter was there. My wife was there, grandson. And we were sitting by the pool. And this young uh, Mexican lady who grew up in the area, probably 22, 23 years old, was teaching Quinn how to swim. She was a local and we kind of got talking about how good she was at teaching swimming. And we we got right to breathing and diving. And, and then I asked her, have you read the book Breath? And she had, she had read it twice. And she said that it was really a kind of a, I wouldn't use the word life-changing, but it was a, uh, a, a big fundamental shift for her and how she was thinking about her life. Um, she was very fit. She, uh, you know, put to use a lot of what is is talked about in the book, but it it allowed her to conceptualize what she wanted to do in her life, and that was to start a swim school uh, in different parts of Mexico for underprivileged children. So, mm. and that's exactly what she's doing, and she's very talented. But so th this book has touched a lot of people. Back to my first question. Uh, I mean, this book is a huge success. Um, I, I don't think you even need to promote it at this point. It just has this momentum. It's one of those books that will just keep going for 10, 15, 20 years until you update it, perhaps. Um, what what to you was successful? I mean, other than sales and and I mean, what 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 do you feel was successful about it for you personally? Well, it's odd because you set out to go on a book tour when your book comes out. And of course, all of mine was canceled. So I lived my life for those two years of promoting this book in this, you know, four by seven office that I yeah. have in my backyard. It's, it's on your website. Doing, it's cute. Yeah. Doing interviews. 
So it wasn't until I was actually able to get out on the road that you see the impact because you have no idea what the impact is. People email no matter what, even if you write a, an article, you're going to get tons of emails from right. that. So it was once I got out on the road, went to Europe, that you start to see this, it, a combination of responses, one of which is people were grateful to get this information. I said, well, I'm just a journalist here, right? I, I'm putting the pieces together, but I'm not the one that did the research. So they're grateful to have the information, but they're also really angry <laughs> that they had to learn this Mm -hmm. from a book by a journalist who didn't know anything about it, you know, until a few years ago. Right. And so it's interesting to see this. There's a certain amount of joy, but a certain amount of frustration at the same time that either we've been led astray in our understanding of breathing and of oral hygiene and of nasal hygiene and more. Or, uh, you know, we uh, need to do something better in our government uh, to start getting very simple things that you can do to help improve your health that cost no money that are available to everybody. So that's been the biggest surprise is that, that joy, that happiness, but also this deep frustration. It's almost shock. I think a lot of patients were very shocked. A lot of readers were very shocked when they read this information. And again, as you said, why am I not getting this from the person I'm paying to take care of me and improve my health and prevent healthcare issues? Um, I, I, I hear that a lot in how I approach dentistry and that's that functional approach and, and teaching and, and practicing upstream in terms of not focusing on the symptoms. So, so, so let's talk about that. Med do you consider yourself to be a medical journalist specifically? And what advantage does a medical journalist have over the general healthcare curriculum when it comes to teaching the latest uh, scientific knowledge uh, to to providers, to future and existing providers. Do you think you have a, 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 a an edge on on the established curriculum teaching medical schools, Absolutely. dental schools? Absolutely not. No zero. Uh, I don't consider myself a medical journalist. Uh, I consider myself a journalist. And I don't want to pigeonhole myself into one specific category because my job and the journalist that all I know, their, their jobs, they have the same approach, is you have to go out and talk to everybody. And so this includes people with a bunch of MDs and PhDs and MSs at the end of their names. But it also includes the guy down the street working out of a garage for 30 years trying right. to fix his health problem who's accrued a lot of very interesting information. So. That guy disavows everything from the wider medical establishment and the wider medical establishment disavows everything from the freelancer. So no one's communicating with one another. So that's the funnest part of my job is I talk to everyone. And sometimes that gets me in trouble because a lot of doctors are saying, mm -hmm. what are you doing talking to a, right. a physicist? No. Why would you talk to a biophysicist about pulmonology? Right. Um, but but I don't care. That's that's what I, I need to be doing. And that's what I did for years and years. That's why this writing this book was so frustrating, mm -hmm. because you could read one book that said, this is how you do this thing. And another one that says it's actually the complete opposite. Right. So where's the truth? And the truth no. is usually right down the middle between right. those two worlds is what I found. See, I think you're being too humble, James. Um, I think in, in some areas you do have a leg up on the medical and dental establishment. Um, it's very difficult to train a practitioner. Uh, I'll speak about dentistry because that's what I know. And to get someone to be a safe beginner or clinician, it takes a lot of work. And there isn't really enough time to expand and get into the latest research. You're, you're starting off from first base kind of thing. And, and you, on the other hand, you see the big picture. You've done the research. You're also not blinded as we practitioners are, because we're, we're brainwashed in school uh, in a way. I think physicians are brainwashed by the Western medical system, pharmacology, the big pharma, treating symptoms. Dentistry is 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 by, by far not perfect either. Again, we're treating symptoms. Uh, you know, there's a hole in the tooth, we'll fix it. But what caused the hole? What can we do to prevent it? I mean, that's a very simplistic view of it. But, um, but I think someone like you that does reach out to everyone and is reading all the latest research and putting it all together very eloquently and, and approachable 
for everyone. I know a lot of practitioners. Uh, I recommend your book to practitioners, not just to patients and readers and and listeners. So, so I think I wouldn't underestimate the power you have, or any medical journalist um, that writes a book like you do, um, on what it can do in furthering and advancing new science. I mean that that's the the subtitle of your book. It's the new science of a lost art. Um, but I, I would say that's it's a, a it's a great skill you have. And I think it's very important. What do you actually, let's talk about that. The new science of a lost art. That's a very interesting subtitle. Explain that for, for us. Well, that subtitle came about because if you look at almost everything that is in this book and a lot of what is happening in our understanding of health right now, all we're trying to do is reverse the clock reverse the clock on what we eat to how we were eating hundreds of years ago, reverse the clock to how we were exercising hundreds of years ago, right. reverse the clock to how we were breathing hundreds of years ago. So this is what is helping people restore their health. Uh, by and large, that's, that's it. That's the name of the game. So I called it a lost art because as you know, the majority of us have lost the ability to breathe properly. And a lot of people say, well, what does that mean? I can breathe just fine. Well, you know, and for the same reason that we've lost our ability to eat properly, you can eat 20 cookies or 20 Twinkies or Ding Dongs a day, you're still getting your calories, but that's an awful way of providing nutrition for your body. So you can right. mouth breathe and breathe these very panty breaths and you can get enough air to survive that way, but it's, you're not going to be healthy. So this new science is we now have measurements, we have machines we can validate what for thousands of years different cultures have known to be beneficial for health. And it's that validation and that data that convinces Westerners. Without it, a lot of people aren't too convinced. I don't blame them because there's so much sketchy stuff out there. So that's how the subtitle came about. It's it's well said and it's uh, it piques your interest. Uh, you know, why is breathing an art and what is the new science, right? Um, do you think we're worse at breathing uh, compared to the rest of the world? I'm talking about the U.S. Uh, it's certainly true when it when you look at our diet. We probably have the worst diet. We certainly do have the worst diet uh, on in you know on the planet. Um, our lifestyle it's very fast. It's kind of you know it's fast food, fast life, shallow breathing. Do you think that's all connected? I mean, in terms of I, I mean, are we worse breathers than, than let's say someone in Germany? I can't tell you how many months I spent on this, trying to figure this out. I was looking at rates of respiratory illness. I was like, well, maybe that's a good gauge. I was looking right. at rates of asthma, but asthma, sometimes that's a gauge of pollution, not right. necessarily how you're breathing. And and it's just impossible to, to find out. You know, If you could say, well, this culture has less respiratory problems, you can't really make that connection that they're breathing better because there could be other environmental issues that their air is cleaner, they have less mold, that kind of thing. So I spent forever trying to figure this out uh, and I failed across the board. Uh, unless you do some huge trials of this, we're never gonna know. What we do know though, is that people in the industrial world, the more industrial of an environment you live in, the worse your breathing is. And right. I don't think anyone would deny that uh, because it's a combination of things. It's not just your habits, your oral posture, the way in which you breathe. It also has to do with allergens and it has to do with, again, mold and pollution. Mm -hmm. And so all those things have tied together um, to create this perfect storm of, of respiratory disaster. And that's what we're all in right now. Right. Yeah, I... I you know, being a sleep trained uh, dental medicine dentist, um, you know, they, they teach you all these numbers, you know, apneas, uh, respiratory rate, uh, even your heart rate, uh, you know, a, there, there's so many numbers in the sleep study. Um, the one that I now am really looking at and falling back on uh, is the respiratory rate at night. When you're completely mm -hmm. relaxed, you're almost dead in terms of your, your muscles are totally relaxed. You're in REM. And you're in this static state. And to me, that is the true revealer of what your airway is doing when it's doing nothing. You're not nervous. You're not awake. Um, 
your your posture isn't necessarily in play. Maybe if you're sleeping incorrectly on a pillow, but but it's just it's just this state where you can just look at that respiratory rate. First, I look for is does it drop? Does it drop? Does it get more relaxed? But if it's it's high, uh, then that person cannot relax and they're not breathing properly. What is the problem then? Is it the airway size? Is it stress? Is it is it the environment as you said? And so th you're you're right. There are a lot of ways to look at this, but it's a very complex issue and it's hard to know. I do think we are probably some of the worst breathers on the planet. Um, and it's, it's a generalization, but, but, and I'm not proud of it, but I think we need to come up with solutions uh, and we're the ones to do it. We came up with the first few good vaccines for COVID. Why aren't we working on breathing? I think we know what the answer is. There isn't a lot of money to be made at it, right? Yeah, I don't I don't know about that. Uh I would like to think that that's not true that not everything is motivated by money. I just think that in medical fields and I know this cuz there's doctors in my family, they just don't have time for it, right? Uh, so my father-in-law who was just here a couple mm -hmm. hours ago, he's been a pulmonologist for 50 years. Right. And you know, he has to send people back. He's like, you're not sick enough. I can't do anything. <laughs> Right. You tell your your AHI is just off the charts, then I can help you. Wait right. till your lungs get severely infected, exactly. and then there's an insurance code for that. There's no insurance code for you know light chronic respiratory dysfunction. Right, and and it's just not people say, oh, uh, you know, go fix it or get bad enough to come back here, and I can right. help you. So I think that it has to do with that system. No one's happy about this, by the way. I'm not pointing fingers at doctors. They're mad, you know, when they're seeing 20 patients an hour, they, they don't have time to sit mm -hmm. them down right. and to teach them how to breathe. So it's a whole systemic problem going on here. And as you know, as the rest of the population knows, the fact is we just have to take our health, a lot of our health, at least preventative health into our own hands now, because right. no one exactly. else is going to do it. Absolutely. What did your father-in-law uh, think of the book being a dyed in the wool pulmonologist and who I've worked with many and uh, it's it's a fascinating part of of the body and uh, but what did he think of the book? The thing that scared him the most and confused me the most he's like yeah about eighty percent of this I've never heard of in my whole life. Wow, I was never taught it and no one ever talks about it. Period. Fascinating. Fascinating. Especially the stuff with asthma, how you can breathe more slowly. Mm -hmm. And science is so clear on this. Yes. And you can reduce your symptoms of asthma. Mm -hmm. Who's talking about that in pulmonology? The answer is basically nobody. There's some psychologists that are talking about it, mm -hmm. but pulmonologists aren't. And that gave him a bit of a fright. And it gave me a fright too. I said, man, <laughs> if you don't know about this. Right. Who knows about it? Who's talking about it? And it turns out that the dentists are mostly talking about this more than anyone else, exactly. which was completely shocking to me. Yeah, you know, I think it's shocking to a lot of dentists. Uh, I talk to practitioners a few every day, and and they want to be more functionally minded. And you know, I'll post something on Instagram, and they've never heard about this. And of course. I've, I say this all the time, you're not going to get this in your curriculum. There's no space or time for it. Um, and you're going to get it postgraduate. You're going to get it in continuing education or by reading a book. Uh, your book being a perfect example of that. Uh, that's very interesting that he was shocked. That's a little worrisome um, and surprising, yeah. but, but we shouldn't be that surprised. And you're right. There is no code uh, in medicine or in dentistry for a one-year-old, an infant with an open mouth that can't breathe through their nose. There's no code for that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, so it's, it is very difficult. I, I think change will come, but it's, it's going to have to happen. I, I can't even imagine where to start. Me healthcare is, is ripe for, um, you know, uh, for big changes, uh, you know, software optimization, maybe AI, I don't know, but because it's the last bastion, uh, I mean, everyone's tried, Google's tried, uh, a, a lot of, uh, very wealthy big corporations have tried to fix healthcare, and uh, and I think the best fix would be to educate the provider better, in, in in a broader sense, in a more global, systemic. You know that you know, for example, gum disease can uh, can produce uh, can cause Alzheimer's, for example. That still that that post which we get out there every 
six to eight weeks still blows minds. Dentists, physicians, they'll even disagree with me. Show me the data. That's simple. Mm. We have a pre-programmed little, uh, uh, it's a series of words that you write that you would never write normally. And that pulls up all the studies and then we just mm. give it to them on Instagram. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's difficult. Um, uh, let's change the subject a little bit. Uh, Junk Food Nation. Do you remember that book by Eric Schlesinger? I do remember that book, of course. I love that. We book. shared the an editor, so uh, okay. We had wow, the same editor. Yeah. So now for funny. this book, for my previous book, yeah. right? For that was for um, Deep, right? Deep. Or, yep, yeah. yep. That's right. Um, uh, it, it occurred to me I was thinking about this interview, and and then I read that a long time ago. Loved the book, mm. didn't see the movie. Um, and he's a great writer. He's written some other very interesting books on how we control and command our nuclear arsenal. Fascinating mm. book, but. I digress. Uh, did the mo most people that have read the book will remember the crux of that book? He ate at McDonald's for a month. Did that inspire you at all? I thought maybe for the that you did a what a ten day uh, test where you basically forced yourself to mouth breathe only. Is that kind of the same approach? And if so, was it effective? Do you think in in, in demonstrating the point? Yeah, you know, uh, I got a lot of flack from my friends thinking that this is what I was doing. They're like, uh, dude, that's already been done before. Right. But I did not view what we did at Stanford as a super size me stunt. I really okay. didn't. And the reason is how many people eat every single meal at McDonald's? No, nobody. Maybe somebody, nobody. <laughs> one meal a day, or they're not around now if right. they, they did. Right. Well, one meal a day or every other day. Like that's exactly. reasonable. Every Weekends. single meal for a month, never no. going to happen. Right. How many people breathe through their mouths? Well, 100% okay. of the time, a lot. <laughs> a lot of them, especially in allergy season. How many people breathe through their mouths at night, about 65%. Mm -hmm. That's the right. percentage that, I, that I've seen. Yep. So what we were doing is trying to say, okay, we've got a huge percentage of the population that is chronically mouth breathing. We know this to be true. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is how specifically does that affect the body throughout the day? What happens right. to cortisol? What specifically happens to sleep? How soon does this turn on? How, mm -hmm. how bad does your sleep get How and how soon? Nobody knew these, these answers. I did not want to do this study. I'll be very clear. I looked and looked and looked and I found animal studies and they're awful where they would plug these poor monkeys', monkeys you know, yeah. noses up with, with silicone for, for years at a time. And But there are no human studies, none. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get a large study with, a few dozen people because that's what is really validating in, mm -hmm. in the world of science impossible zero money to do that and that's right. why Stan luckily NIAC down at Stanford allowed us he allowed us to use his lab we still had to pay for it but use his lab and the max amount of people was two mm -hmm. so you know two people what does that mean our, our data not a lot but what we were doing was just personally experiencing what so many people experience every single day. And the difference mm -hmm. was we we're collecting data. So I was hoping that that would inspire this teeny little pilot would inspire someone to do a larger study in the right. drive. Nobody's done it. And right. I doubt they will ever do it. So there you go. I think, I mean, you demonstrated the profound effect. And of course, you you did it in, in an environment where it happened suddenly to you. Uh, and I encourage everyone that has not read the book. This is the the I think the the core uh, or the 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 climax of the book and the results of it because it really demonstrates it's not a stunt at all. Uh, it really demonstrates um, precisely what it's like to not to be able to breathe through your nose. And it's not just a matter of which way the air goes. It's it can it can affect your demeanor during the day. It can. It affects the, the your your entire biology, uh, the alkalinity of your blood, uh, anxiety. Uh, it's not just about how well you breathe at night or maybe your performance while you're running, that kind of thing. But but um, definitely not a stun. Uh, I was a little worried for you when I read that you were doing that. As I was reading through the book, I mean, this is not going to turn out well. Most people that get to the point where you induced, you know, for, for you and your friend. Um, uh, a study of two, uh, 
you know, people get there gradually and they're used to it. And, and, but that's the beauty of your study is that no one, no one knows what it's like until you get there suddenly. And then, or when you take something away, then you realize this is not a good state. They've gotten used to that state of anxiety, sympathetic tone, shallow breathing, uh, you know, uh, lack of appetite control because of hormonal issues and sleep issues at night because they're not breathing properly. So I think the, I think that was, I, I would love to see a larger study, but I think there's, um, I, I think to be honest, to give the doctors some credit, they understand how dangerous this is. Hmm. I mean, you could have thrown a blood clot, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, well, we don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so there aren't enough people to know, but I think the one, you know, what you just said there is 100% true. When this comes on gradually, the body's really good at compensating, mm -hmm. right? The body is going to keep you alive. Right. But that doesn't mean it's going to keep you healthy. Right. And so all of these people, their inflammation is gradually increasing. Their anxiety is gradually increasing. Their sleep is getting worse and worse and worse. This becomes their new normal. And the, the alkalinity in their blood just mm -hmm. stays at this certain level the kidneys start responding. This is fine. The body can do this for a short amount of time. Exactly. After a few months or a few years, you're toast. And that's what's happened with so right. many people. And they don't know why. And practitioners and doctors don't know why. They're like, we don't know why you're so sick all the time. Because this thing has slowly, slowly worked up. So when you do it suddenly, you feel Every single thing come on right. and you were able to confirm blood pressure, stress levels, uh, reduce athletic performance, uh, snoring and sleep apnea, you know, from zero to four hours a night. Mm -hmm. That's not subtle. No. <laughs> and then it all goes away <laughs> when you yeah. start breathing through your nose. Right. And you still have people, you know, that aren't ENTs and, and other people who are, especially with kids, talking to kids who aren't discussing this with kids. Do you breathe through your mouth? Okay, we need to find a way of making you a nasal breather. It's going to affect the, your facial form later right. on in life, and it's going to affect so many other things. Right. Hopefully that word is getting out. You know, I think it's a long time coming. The science is there, but mm -hmm. it's really up to the practitioners and, and doctors to start using this a little more. Even if it's just a few words of advice, I think that could be helpful. Right. I think you're right. The you said it well, the, uh, the, uh, the, the body is an amazing organism machine, whatever you want to call it. Um, and when it can accommodate two problems within the machine, it'll self-diagnose, it'll correct, it'll self-correct, but it always comes with a price. I, I think that's important that people know that. And it, it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily brilliant in that it's going to let you continue, uh, in your normal state or in your optimal state, but it allows you to continue. And that's all that, you know, evolution really wants us to do is to live as long as possible, make sure we have babies and, and raise them. And I mean, that's really that that's the, that's the purpose. I know it sounds very depressing. Uh, let's change the subject again. So uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, when I was 10 years old was Jules Verne. You remember Jules Verne. So Jules Verne was great. He was French. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And where, where I'm going with this is, is a Jules Verne was a science fiction writer. He wrote these incredible stories about things that didn't exist, like submarines that could travel underwater around the world. And it had weapons and an amazing, you know, uh, you could walk on the bottom of the ocean. And, and uh, what I liked about his books is that he introduced new science to us, much like what you've done with breath. And it was a fantastic journey like breath. It was interesting. Like, you know, your time that you spent in the catacombs in Paris and, and kind of the, the self journey that you took through that, that, uh, study that you did at Stanford. So, uh, my question is this, did you pen the word pulmonot, pul pulmonot? I mean, I looked that up there. There is a word out there for pulmonate, which I love the adjective for having lungs, I guess we're all pulmonates or, you know, uh, but where, where did you come up with that name? It's a, it's a very, uh, it, it would be a great name for a rock band. <laughs> it's that good. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to call these people who fit outside of a specific medical field, but were fascinated with breathing and how breathing could help heal the body of chronic mm -hmm. illnesses. 
So you have pulmonologists, of course, and you have dentists, and but you also have these freelancers who are working the aeronautical industry, and right. you have chefs, and you have school teachers, and they but they've accrued all of this information. I thought their stories were fascinating. Choir conductors who ended up being incredibly good at rehabilitating people through breathing exercises. So what do you call them? You know, f f fans of breathing, um, uh, breathing fanatics. Um, and that was a word that came to me because I thought of astronauts, someone who was really exploring mm -hmm. this field in different ways and looking at new horizons, new approaches to mm -hmm. it. And that's how I came up with that, that word. Yeah, I need to, someone told me, they're, they're like, you need to trademark. Trademark it. I was gonna, just going to say. <laughs> It's I don't a, know how to do right. that. Maybe open AI can can help me. I'll I'll do that right <laughs> after this this call. Right, but it is go. printed in the book uh, and there's no other record of it. So exactly. that, that helps. Yep. You're right. No, it's a, it's a great uh, I, I loved it. It was great. Um you know, again, thinking about this interview, um and I mention this often to my patients and and to anyone who's willing to listen, you know, as a young man, I really abused my sleep because I was able to. Um a lot of adrenaline, a lot of energy. Uh, I would maybe feel a little tired around 10 o'clock and then power through that and and stay up till one, get lots of work done or listen to music or read and and thought, this is not a problem. How do we get the, and of course now I'm totally different. You know, I look at my aura ring results and if I'm not in bed by 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm pretty upset. Uh, uh, how do we get the young people out there like, probably you and I, you know, were certainly, uh, how do we get them to appreciate the importance of sleep? I mean, it's, I talk about it a lot and it's, they kind of laugh. They, they're they like, I, I don't need it. I feel great. Well, I mean, you've got a younger body. It's mm -hmm. working much more efficiently. Um, talk about compensating mm -hmm. for bad food and bad right. sleep and yeah. no exercise. You can do that for a while, but Right. As you know, and as I know, you get to a certain age and you cannot do that for no. forever. I was the same way. I used to go to bed around 11 or 12 every nope. single night. Right. I'd wake up around, you know, 6.30 or 7. I would, thought I was good to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even 10 years ago, I remember it was this kind of macho thing. How many hours you sleep? Oh, I got three hours. You know, you come in on a red eye and you're exactly. just out all day, out all night in New York. And, oh, I got four hours. I'm good to go. But I think that the awareness about sleep, especially from Matthew Walker's book, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Excellent. I think that that helped push things in a different direction. Now you've got millennials and Gen Z, at least the ones that I'm seeing, who are wearing aura rings or whoop yes. bands. And they're right. comparing who slept better. So yeah. everything has to be a competition, but right. that's kind of a good competition. You know, What are your numbers? How many hours did you sleep? How much right. deep sleep did you get? So I think the word is out there. And as long as... With all this stuff, I don't want to sit on some, you know, pedestal and, and scold people for eating improperly, breathing improperly. Right. I don't care what people do, right? We're free people. We should be able to do whatever we want. But I do feel that people should have choices. Yes. So in order to have a choice, you need information. So you need the information of what's going to happen to your body after a certain age if you don't sleep well. It's the same thing with breathing, same thing with not flossing. And then people can do whatever they want with that information. It's right. when they don't get that information that I think is a real problem. Right. Um, and hopefully we're changing that in this new culture where people can hop on podcasts and look at right. Twitter and look at Instagram. Right. And you see what's happening in the health space of all of these social media Yes. Uh, areas and it's really inspiring it shows you that for people who are curious there is information that can help them it costs little or nothing at all and it's been scientifically proven to help their right. their health yeah the de democratization of healthcare and mm -hmm. healthcare information on the web it is amazing although you know you've 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 got a lot of physicians that are poo-pooing like mouth taping you know they they call the tiktoker uh, I mean, they don't understand it. And it, there's a lot of confusion still with uh, all this information that's coming at us. In fact, we're being bombarded. And I've actually seen a lot of patients uh, over respond to it like, oh, it's just too much. I, I just can't conceptualize it or quantify it. And so I'm just going to do what I'm doing. 
And so, but but that's not the norm. Uh, most people are, especially the the younger generations, they are soaking this information up. Uh, and then, but the other problem is that then you go see your physician or dentist, and they look at you with a blank face, going, "What the heck are you talking about?" Right. So, anyway, it'll all it'll all work out eventually. I'm sure. It's just going to take a little bit more time. Um, um, how? Um, was researching and writing this book, was it cathartic for you? I know that you you talk about it in the book, some of your personal health issues with breathing and sleeping, but was actually writing the book and then seeing people respond to it and, and the huge success, was that cathartic in a way for you? Well, there were two things you mentioned. So there's the after the book comes out and then there's the writing the book. The writing this book was not cathartic. It was <laughs> awful. It was it was miserable. This is the hardest thing I've ever done in my wow. life. I'm not trying to be over dramatic. Right, right. But some books come out very naturally and easy, just like some magazine articles, some flow, some take a lot more time. This was so difficult because And they would all give me a different answer. And then they would all say, oh, the, all the other people are crazy. This is the way it works. Right. And then I talked to 10 different dentists and they would all say completely different things. So there was no book. There's no manual. You would figure, well, I'm just going to go to PubMed and find out for myself. Cool. There's 20,000 studies. Yeah. How do you bake that down into two paragraphs? Right. So there was there was the research side of it. And then there was the storytelling side of it, because you don't just want a bunch of research. If no one reads it, then what's what's the point? You know, my job as a journalist is you want people to read, you have to entertain them. A lot of journalists poo-poo that, but mm -hmm. you're an entertainer right. as well as a yes. as providing inf information. And if people stop reading, you have failed. Right. Exactly. So you have to tie those two things together. And that's what made this really, really hard. I wrote four three to four different versions of this book and I couldn't crack it. And finally on the very last one, everything sort of swirled together and came into place but it took me years and uh really confused all my friends they thought this was the stupidest idea i had other offers to do other books and i almost did it because this wow. was so miserable right um but uh but i stuck with it because of all the things that you mentioned it completely changed my life learning how to, I don't talk about this in the book because I didn't want people to think that what happened to me was going to happen to them, but it absolutely miraculously changed a bunch of problems I had. I was convinced the information was important. I was convinced that people wanted to hear it, but they needed to hear it in a certain way. And that's what took a while. Right. Well, I'm glad you had to go through for three or four different iterations of the book, because I think that really produce the results I mean, that we have now. This book is absolutely a great teaching tool. Uh, it is entertaining. I always, it's one of the first things I mentioned about the book, I used to call it the, I think I mentioned it to you once, the Indiana Jones of breathing. You know, it's just like this kind of crazy journey that you take to find out more about it. Um, the Jules Verne analogy, of course, I think is even better, but um, uh, a few more questions. Um, having finished the book, um, do you feel that there's anything that needs further examination? Is there anything unsaid? There were a few things that I should have done better and I should have elaborated on. Of course, I didn't know that at the time when right. I finished this three years ago. Luckily, the paperback is coming out next year and the publisher, they usually don't allow people to do this, but I begged. Mm hmm and they have allowed me to put in about 10 new pages, which isn't a lot, but it's enough to get the message across. Uh, one thing that I should have talked a lot more about is sleep disordered breathing with young people mm -hmm. and infants and in babies, because right. I think this is absolutely destroying kids' health before mm -hmm. they even have a chance to be healthy or have right. the choice to be right. healthy. And I think it is so underdiagnosed and I think it's borderline sure. criminal. Yep. That people are not looking at breathing, but they're looking at everything else. So that's one section that's going in. There's a bunch of new studies that are going in the back for the geeks who want to go geek out on that. Mm -hmm. Specifically CO2. So I talk a lot about the benefits of CO2, but I'm talking about endogenous CO2, the CO2 that you make in your body. Mm -hmm. If you are in a room 
with high levels of CO2 all day long, and a lot of office workers are, right. this is debilitating to your right. ability to think, yep. to your ability to build strong bones, to blood vessel development, and more. Oh, I'll, show you, yep. I'll show you this. I've been traveling the, the world with this thing. Yes. This is a CO2 monitor. Right. And I am absolutely astounded Amazing. at the levels I'm getting in airplanes. Goes up to around 2,000 parts per million, sometimes 3,000 parts per million, right. which is four to five times higher yep. than um, is what is considered safe and healthy. Yep. And sometimes you go into hotel rooms, and I love these whoever these middle managers are who have now sealed up windows in hotels. Yep, so you can't even open them. Yep, yep. And this thing is rocking at 2,500 all day long. And you wonder why people feel like crap. Right. So that's a very long way of saying I have put in about a page and a half about CO2. And I think that this thing, this indoor pollution is going to be big, big news. And I think yep. it's going to be big news when people start suing their apartments they right. start suing hotels and i think they should if they're just allowing you to cook in four thousand parts per million yep. day in and day out no i travel with one of those as well i had a patient you do who, yeah oh yeah we uh, didn't i didn't know this anyone that's listening i had yeah. no idea but no, no no it's a it's great that you mentioned that and i i wonder about our the environment in cars cars are very well sealed these days and if you push that research button uh, you know, and and the air, the rebreathers on planes. Uh, some of the newer planes are better, but the old, the yeah. plane, most of the planes that are flying now are very dangerous, uh, and not just viruses and 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 bugs that you can catch, but uh, the CO CO two content, and also some of the older planes which are still flying. Uh, that whole ventilation system mix is powered by the turbofan, and some of the oil that's used to lubricate the jet engine, which is very important, some of that, those fumes get into the cabin air. And there's lots on the web about this. And our air is, I mean, I can filter my water. I can eat well. I can work hard at finding foods. I can even grow my own food. But getting air these days, that is tough for people. And we are subjected to a lot of bad air. And I do think it, 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 it makes, I think it's responsible for violence, violent thoughts, uh, 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 negative thoughts, uh, feeling poorly, generally, uh, maybe affecting the response time when you are in a car. Uh, you know, there, there are so many ways we can go there, but I think that's a great device. Uh, and uh, we always travel with it no matter what. I had a patient who was a diver. I think you'd like this story and healthy guy, young guy, he was in Cancun, I think. And they gave him, there was a there was an extra room available to him. It was given to him at a discount because the place was full. He had been diving all week. And then at night, he would go and sleep in the room. And the room was next to the boiler room, which was being powered by a power source that was venting CO2. And there was a leak. So he was breathing in CO2 at night. So then, of course, he did that for a week. Then he got on the plane. And the plane had to make an emergency landing. Of course, they had to get him into the iron lung because his O2, CO2 mix in the tissue was off because he was sleeping in a room high in CO2. It almost killed him. Uh, that's an extreme example, but I agree with you 100%. It's, but, but I think you'd be, by the way, you're 100% right with these uh, old airplanes. They are the worst, especially regional airlines yes. are yeah. the worst. The right. newer ones are a lot better. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've noticed, you know, people are still wearing masks and there is, you know, mass work, especially if everyone wears them. Right. But masks are going to do nothing. If the CO2 is up to 5000 yep. parts per million, that means one in every six breaths is someone else's breath backwash. Exactly. I don't care how many masks you're wearing. If you're in a subway and the CO2 is that high and the yep. CO2 is in when you're in a group of around other people is indicative of of how much human exhaust is in the air. That's yes. what it is. You're, right. you're next to a boiler, that's indicative of, uh, of how close you are to the boiler. But, right. but this shows you um, how much of the air that you are breathing is actually someone else's exhales. Exactly. And uh, the, the fact that the governments aren't on this, they're saying wear, wear double masks, 
Mm-hmm. So next time you're in an Uber, everybody, or a Lyft or whatever, mm-hmm. and you've got a long, I don't care how cold it is outside. The very first thing I do, even if the guy's wearing a mask, mm-hmm. I roll down the window, window. a little bit. And I, exactly. and I say, too bad. This yep. is how it is. Yeah. No, fresh air, I think, is probably, if you had to choose between the two, a mask or fresh air. Of course, we can't roll down the window in a plane at 50, yeah. 40,000 feet. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I'll actually put a link. Uh, into the show notes on that. Uh, we don't talk about that enough. And uh, that's a great point you bring up. Uh, boy, you could write a book just on that, right? Um, I'm, I'm uh, going to be posting. I've been taking pictures and recording. So I'm going to be, whenever I have time to do some more social media, posting what planes had what CO2 at yes. what time and what hotels. And I think that this may be a way of getting them to change things, especially yes. if you start outing hotels. I agree. They're not going to like that. So right. I'm working on this. It'll come whenever I have two seconds to take a breath right. and, and well, post sure. more stuff. Sure. But you should sure. start uh, taking pictures too, yeah. uh, documenting it. And uh, and yeah. we'll, we'll start bringing this out to the world. Yeah, I've had, my wife and I have talked about that, building a website on that information. Uh, real quick tip for everyone, now that we have your interest, the Boeing 787 probably has the best air quality and does not mix the, uh, does not use the turbo fan in the engine. So you're not getting that oil vaporized petroleum products into your lungs, which are potentially very, very dangerous because, and that's, the problem is, is that they power that with a uh, lithium hydride battery. And that was the battery in the beginning that was catching on fire. I think they have fixed that, but the the quality of air and the, they call them rebreathers and they're filtering the air because it's carbon fiber. Uh, instead of being aluminum, uh, they can pressurize the plane more because it can take that pressurization at high altitude. So if you've got a lot of internal pressure and outside is very little ambient pressure, that could destroy the plane. They're able to do that because of its of the how how they build the plane and the air quality is better. Is it optimal? I don't know, but it is safer. So there's a plug for Boeing. <laughs> Um, they need more... it, by the way. Yeah, they do. <laughs> You're good. right. They do. Yeah, there are more Airbuses are being sold than Boeing's currently, but uh, hopefully they'll come back. Um, two more questions. Uh, we spoke two, two and a half years ago. You interviewed me. I interviewed you. Uh, I forget which one it was, uh, but I asked you, which I, in retrospect, is I, I think is kind of rude, especially now what I've heard, how difficult, how non-cathartic the process of writing the book was it's like asking a pregnant woman, well, how many kids do you want after she gives birth to the first one? I think I asked you, what's your next book going to be on? And you said, you said, uh, well, I'm going to let the dust settle. (laughs) Has the dust settled is my question. No, it it has not settled. However, uh, after talking about, you know, what I have written for, for so long, I have had this deepest desire to go back to being left alone and in, in writing that this is where I get charged up. This is th- that's my home. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I took Christmas vacation because that's when all the emails stop to write. And I thought, oh, my God, do I miss this? So I have a the proposals going out next should be going out next week. I have a whole new wow. book idea that's going to take me on a new adventure. I cannot wait to go back to listening to people. Um, and uh, that's, I love asking questions. I love answering them too. This is, this is, it's been such a privilege to be on so many podcasts, but uh, I'm, I'm feeding off of new knowledge right now. And it's just such a thrill. I absolutely love my job. No, and, and it shows it really does. I think I lost you. Oh, you're back. Good. Um, last question. And again, it could be another one of those, rude questions. Uh, I think everybody wants to know what you're going to write about. I'm not going to ask you that question, but I am going to ask you about the name of your dog. Face. Is that is that a clue or a hint? Is that something we should pay attention to? Face, <laughs> rest in peace, face. Oh, oh. Face has left us. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I'm My sorry. Titus brought, no, it's okay. It was okay. a while ago. It was Great years name. ago. Great name for a but, dog. But man, uh, yeah, amazing dog went absolutely oh. everywhere with me. Got a new dog. That's okay. It happens. Everyone knows it's the saddest thing that will ever happen in absolutely. your life. Yep. But uh, and the name, but the name I, of your dog now, your new dog. 
Mimes, we call her Mimes, not my name, but that's her name. We thought we were getting this uh, crazy mutt, and uh, she's even crazier than we thought, but amazing <laughs> little beast. Right. I can hang out with dogs all day long or not have any, any problem. So yeah. as far as what I'm what I'm working on, I, I just don't talk about it. Uh, I don't talk about and you it for a, a couple reasons, because uh, then people will expect something. And then of if course. I write something different, they get mad. And because people like stealing stuff. So uh, right. I'm not talking about that at all. It's just my little secret. Give me a couple of years and uh, yep. Yep. it should be out. Well, I'm I'm going to put in a little request. You can you can ignore it. What what this world right now needs is a comprehensive overview and explanation of how facial development affects the, your destiny in terms of overall health and happiness and well being and and I'll just leave it at that. But everything you've done up to this point, I'm sure there's more coming. If you disappear for the next two years, we should all be very fingers crossed very happy that you are uh writing another book uh breath uh again i've got a few copies this is my main copy i've read it three times it really is a exceptional uh book i re i do recommend it all the time it's one of my easiest recommendations to make again i'm fielding questions a lot with moms and kids that are mouth breathing and snoring and you know it's uh it's a it's a great place to start and end actually it's a fantastic book thank you so much for writing it thank you so much for taking uh time i know you're leaving on a plane tomorrow and and uh you're 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 a, a busy guy uh hopefully you can get some rest and and even better i hope you those proposals go well with the publisher and you can disappear i think you wrote most of breath in a little barn up in volcano california right yeah Barns Very are good. Yes, I think only you would know where volcano is. And oh, I know where volcano you, is. You no, know just where that is. Okay, yeah. population one hundred and three. By the that's way, that's all you need. That's probably too many. <laughs> A few too many. <laughs> so, anyway, good luck to you. Safe travels. Uh, always wonderful speaking with you, and I'm very much looking forward to your next book and actually anything um, that you're going to write and talk about. How would you like people to uh, look you up? I, I like your website because it shows the journey of. Your early stuff, your 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 articles that you wrote for magazines on like biofuel and biodiesel, all the way up to to breath and and your previous books. Is that a good place for people to go? I'll put that in the show notes. It's jamesnestor.com. Yeah, you you can go there. Uh, all the references are are free there. There's no paywall. Um, mm -hmm. All of the entire bibliography is there. There's some videos. There's some links on how to breathe better. It's open to everyone. And my Instagram, uh, you know, I was I was trying to get better at the social media. I don't post sure. pictures of my food or or dog or whatever, <laughs> but but man, I just have I've been traveling the last three months and uh but it will be coming back. I okay. promise you. There's a Good. bunch of stuff I just have not had any time. So my Instagram is Mr. Mr. James Nestor. Great. Thank you so much, James, for your time. A pleasure talking with you. And uh we'll hopefully we'll talk and see you soon. Excellent. Thanks a lot for having me.